Tonight's program on U.S.-Iran relations is brought to us by Ambassador Thomas Pickering. Uh, this is a return event for the Ambassador. He was here almost three years ago in January of 2017. Uh, he's got a, a, a more narrowly focused topic now instead of the whole East, specifically on U.S.-Iran relations. Uh, the Ambassador began as a higher education at a wonderful small liberal arts college, Bowdoin, and has degrees from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the University of Melbourne, and was further, I'll call it, further educated in the U.S. Navy and Naval Reserve. He came to the State Department, and after serving as a special assistant to Secretary of State William Rogers and Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, climbed very rapidly through the Foreign Service ranks to the rank of Ambassador and served as Ambassador to El Salvador, India, Israel, Nigeria, Jordan, the Russian Federation, all very interesting, challenging places. Uh, back in the Washington, D.C., he served as Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Ocean Environment and Scientific Affairs as well as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations at a particularly critical time, the first Gulf War, where we built an amazing coalition to accompany us for that, which I still think is one of the most remarkable diplomatic accomplishments in recent, in recent decades. Uh, he finished his career as the Under Secretary for Political Affairs, the third highest ranked uh, position within the State Department and received many awards, including the Distinguished Service Award from the State Department, their highest recognition. He's not exactly been quiet in retirement. He's led an active life uh, working for Boeing. Uh, he's currently vice chair of an international consulting group, Boeing Company. He's active in a number of nonprofits including the American Academy of Diplomacy with our good friend and colleague, Ambassador Ron Newman. I would like to remind you that we will have questions at the end, so hold your questions till the end. Unfortunately, the Ambassador is going to need to return, so after we're done with our Q&A sessions, we're not going to do the usual of come up to the stage for subsequent questions. I'm also going to, as a, uh, 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 point for our younger audience asked that the first uh, few questions be from our students to let them get started in part because they always do they always set the right example of not pontificating and asking a single, a single question so I think they'll set the right tone for us on that. So without further ado please join me in welcoming Ambassador Thomas Baker. much and thank you Peter for that wonderful introduction. I, uh, I'm afraid probably I'll break the strict rule on non-pontification, <laughs> and I'll do my best. It's wonderful to be here, wonderful to be back in, in Richmond, and thank you all very much for coming out. Uh, Iran in some ways has probably slid a little bit from the near horizon, but nevertheless I think remains important and in many ways puzzling and challenging. And I hope tonight to talk uh, very briefly, but I hope uh, interestingly and maybe even informatively a bit about the Iran flirtation with nuclear, uh, some uh, about the agreement that was made to try to stop that, uh, and spend a little bit of time on the future and how and in what way we might think about going forward in the best of all worlds, even if not the best of all worlds, being totally present at the present time. Uh, in any event, the Iranians under the Shah had real aspirations for full development and a lot of interest in technology across the board, and some of it military and the Shah uh, quickly took advantage of President Eisenhower's offer on Adams for Peace 
and invested money in an atomic program uh, built around a research reactor, which we provided, uh, plus a growing interest in the production of electrical power uh, with nuclear energy, something very much akin to what many other countries did in those days. And at the same time, uh, he projected ahead a 22 reactor uh, electrical power production system for Iran based on nuclear. So he was quite expansive and interestingly enough, the plans of the current Iranian administration have kept alive the 20 or 22 reactor target. Uh, the uh, Shah as well, uh, I think, had broader plans perhaps in his own mind, who am I to know? Uh, but it was not clear to any of us that one could totally dismiss the idea uh, that the Shah and Shah would be thinking of nuclear weapons at some point. Uh, and I was never sure that if he were thinking of nuclear weapons, whether anybody in the United States was thinking of trying to find a way to stop him. Uh, and that was, of course, worrying, and it's come to a head with a different Iranian administration, one much less reliable and adherent uh, to the kinds of approaches that we set and as a result has been a considerable problem for the United States and the world community uh, ever since the Iranian revolutionary regime administration took up the question uh, of dealing with nuclear. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, after the revolution, the regime discarded the nuclear program. For them, it was an extra expense, maybe uh, a monarchical bubble, something that was not something they put a great deal of interest or indeed funding in. Uh, and that remained true even through the deleterious and disastrous for both countries Iraq-Iran war in the 1980s, something that killed a great number of people, destroyed a great deal of the landscape, and was totally non-productive. It ended almost where it began after eight years of mayhem. Uh, I think the Iranians were very impressed by the fact that the Iraqis used gas warfare against them, another weapon of mass destruction, uh, but set themselves, and I think probably historical evidence will support this, that they would not do so. Whether they went into research in the subject or not is a little less clear. Uh, what is clear is that gradually, after the end of that war, and as they looked around the region, they once again began to take up an interest in nuclear. And so roughly between 93 and 2003, they had a growing and increasingly vigorous program, uh, during which uh, they actually bought some equipment from Pakistan. Uh, the Pakistani uh, progenitor of their nuclear program, Dr. A.Q. Khan, uh, was busy selling stuff around the world. Uh, <laughs> A, a good, solid Pakistani, he did not miss an opportunity uh, to make an opportunity, if I can put it that way, for himself in the process, and, and promoted his own future inside Pakistan by becoming a kind of technological godfather uh, to proliferators, including Libya uh, and Pakistan, and perhaps uh, to some extent North Korea. Uh, we owe him a serious debt of retribution. Uh, before his non-contributions to the In any event, uh, uh, carloads of stuff uh, arrived in Pakistan. Happily, it was first-generation stuff that Pakistan was discarding. Early centrifuges with a very low output. And it is true that despite all of uh, Iran's independent efforts, since then to develop a new generation of centrifuges, they still are pretty much stuck with the first generation Pakistani centrifuge. It is also interesting that during that time, uh, we, I think, re received information that we considered reliable, and so did the Europeans, and quite possibly the Russians and Chinese, that uh, Iranian interest extended beyond using uh, nuclear uh, research for medicine, beyond using it for electrical power production, and we're very worried about increasing Iranian interest in the enrichment of uranium, uh, beyond perhaps what was necessary for nuclear power, and the development of a reactor to produce plutonium, uh, designed, at least in the view of our technical experts, rather ideally, uh, for the production of plutonium and for not much else. And these were worrying. The Europeans, out ahead of us, uh, took on the job of negotiating with the Iranians, 
Uh, this was important because we had very little in the way of any official contact with the Iranians between 1979, uh, when relations were broken off, uh, and then 1993, 2000, and beyond. And we were a silent uh, and important partner in the negotiations, but never came to the table in part because the Iranians wouldn't deal with us and we weren't dealing with them. Uh, uh, an interesting comment on what slowed down the negotiations. The Europeans were successful, interestingly enough, in creating a two-year moratorium on Iranian enrichment back in around 2003. That fell apart. It fell apart because our view was that no enrichment was the only policy that would work with Iran, particularly with the Revolutionary Administration, uh, and that therefore we should hold tough. And we did our best and were very successful in holding the Europeans tough on that policy. And that policy would have obviously been the best policy, but it was not a policy the Iranians were prepared to accept, and they held out rigidly uh, for at least some indication that the rest of the world um, had a, a willingness uh, to recognize that as members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, they had a right uh, to nuclear technology, including enrichment, which was not forbidden by the treaty. It was a big loophole in the treaty. We said to the Europeans, uh-uh, we aren't agreeing to have a, only a two-year moratorium, which is what they negotiated. And the Iranians explained to the Europeans that uh, we went into this moratorium because you told us if we behaved ourselves, uh, we would have the right to enjoy nuclear power. And we have behaved ourselves for two years, and now we want to go back and develop our own capacity to make our own fuel for our own reactors. And there was a, not an uh, illegitimate reason for that. The Shah had invested multiple millions of dollars in an enrichment facility in France based on a different principle, but nevertheless productive of what he would need for his own reactors. Uh, and the French, uh, when the revolution took place, said, gosh, uh, this revolutionary group isn't going to have access to enrichment in our country. Uh, and by the way, we don't owe them anything because they're a different regime. And so the Iranian new regime felt very much bereft, if you could put it this way, uh, that all that money had gone to France and none of it was coming back to them. Uh, we had a similar problem with Iran over money that went for arms in the United States, and it took many years and much arbitration to work that out. In any event, that program came to be the centerpiece of the divisions between Iran uh, and the Europeans, the Russians, the Chinese, uh, the European Union, and the United States. And a process of negotiations continued after 2003. But it was not a fruitful negotiation. In effect, you could say that a, a negotiation took place at least once a year. And the central purpose of that negotiation, unfortunately, was to decide when the next meeting would take place. It was that unproductive. Uh, and we became increasingly worried because Iran went from 128 centrifuges during this process to 19,000. So it gives you a sense of how capable they were of developing the old technology and using it to produce increasing amounts uh, of enriched uranium. They also went from producing a small amount uh, of uranium enriched merely for reactors, not a bomb danger, to increasing amounts of uranium enriched over or around 20%, which became close to uh, the possibility uh, of moving into the bomb business. And the higher enrichment levels you achieve in uranium, the easier it is to move up the next steps. So the first 3% is very hard. The next 20% less so, uh, and the next 60% much less so. So we understood this, and we understood the problems. Um, and that meant that when the Obama administration came in, uh, they had a new look. Um, but at the end of the George W. Bush administration, they also began to send a senior American to the negotiations and to participate. And that was an interesting signal. Uh, the uh, Obama attendance at the negotiation continued, but without much really productive change until 2011-2012.
And then I think it became clear to the United States that it might be better to try a different approach to Iran. And that different approach would be some enrichment would be allowed, but under very strict international monitoring and control. And that we would ramp up our economic sanctions against Iran as an effort to build leverage on the Iranians to accept this particular kind of approach. And coupled with it would be that the unfinished production reactor for plutonium would never be completed, uh, and that the reactor would be changed to minimize its pr production of plutonium, and they would have to export plutonium. And these were some of the bases for the subsequent agreement. Uh, in the middle of 2012, uh, even before that then election uh, in Iran that produced uh, uh, President Rouhani, um, there began to be a private interchange between the United States and Iran uh, through the small Arab country of Oman in the Gulf. And Oman had, for historical and other reasons, a good connection with both uh, Iran and the United States. And the U.S. government took advantage of that uh, to seek to set up uh, potentially, and it took place, uh, the beginnings of a series of secret meetings first in Oman, uh, in Oman and then in later in, in various other places. That secrecy held for at least uh, six or seven months. It was also, I think, important to note that in a letter that has never been made public, but it seemed to be quite clear, uh, President Obama was able to assure the supreme leader of Iran that we would negotiate first on the basis that there would be some permitted enrichment, but not to the point where they could use it to make a nuclear weapon, and that the United States was not seeking regime change in Iran, something the Iranians had been worried about, not just because they thought it was a theoretical possibility, but they heard many Americans indeed espousing it as a U.S. policy alternative or option. And those were helpful in opening the door. It was also, I think, helpful in opening the door to agreement uh, that we began to add sanctions to an already very heavy sanction regime against Iran. Sanctions beginning way back uh, in the late 1970s when the Iranians arrested and imprisoned our diplomats for 440 days. And sanctions that obviously took into account Iranian treatment of its own citizens and others on the basis of a discriminatory religious set of practices on their part and their intervention in a number of uh, political and military situations around the region in ways that we objected to. So we had a long list of difficulties. Uh, interestingly enough, while the first couple of meetings were slow, progress started. And after a few months, they were able to scope out a preliminary arrangement which began to deal uh, with, in effect, freezing Iran's nuclear program, uh, at least until a bigger and more conclusive restrictive arrangement could be reached. Uh, the first agreement uh, was reached uh, in November of 2013, uh, and uh, it was not a complete agreement, uh, but it was a help and the Iranians complied with the monitoring arrangements and some of the sanctions were taken off and other efforts were made uh, to assure the Iranians that if they behave themselves there would be an entree into a different system uh, and that Iran could become, as it wanted clearly, a member in full standing of the international community rather than a massive pariah state, uh, highly excluded. Uh, that agreement had an interesting clause that said that in the next six months we'll negotiate the final agreement. Uh, the final agreement took four extensions of six months to negotiate. It wasn't completed until January 15, uh, 2015. The second agreement, uh, by far the most important, and perhaps one of the most important arms control and nuclear agreements ever reached, in effect was based on the simple principle that Iran will so limit its nuclear activities uh, that those limitations 
carefully controlled by international inspection systems will mean that it will never be able to make a nuclear weapon. And that at the same time, it, it also agreed to the inspection system. And on the other side, sanctions would be taken off that had been put on uh, to deal with Iran's nuclear program. Uh, many people don't know that in that agreement, the United States was not asked to take off any direct sanctions against Iran. They continued. The United States did take off sanctions against its friends and allies that were designed to keep them from trading with Iran in things that we thought uh, were both deleterious to the nuclear equation and at the same time supported Iran's economy. Uh, many are very proud of the fact that our sanctions regime, uh, supported by our friends and allies, there were a number of sanctions that were adopted by the United Nations Security Council applying to the world community, were successful. And I have to tell you that my view is that while those sanctions were important, they were not conclusive. What was conclusive in injuring the Iranian economy that brought them to the table and provided continued leverage until we got the agreement on, S on us to get the concessions we needed was the fact that first and foremost, President Ahmadinejad, you remember him? Yeah. Uh, reformed the, the Iranian economy to his own lights and screwed it up very badly. Mm -hmm. And that meant that as our economic sanctions went on, they went on the base of a declining economy quite seriously. But then there was that gift that has kept on giving occasionally for us, the world oil price declined uh, and did so markedly. And so Iran had this combination of a bad and declining domestic economy, sanctions that inhibited particularly the trade relationships that Iran was engaged in, and then a blow to the fundamental economic pillar of their economy, the oil regime. And that helped enormously and it's one of the reasons why we move forward. I think the January 15th agreement one can characterize along the following lines. Uh, those of us who had been uh, engaging with Iranian non-officials and some officials in something called track two diplomacy, essentially unofficial diplomacy, uh, and who had followed this for a long time, uh, were in our views amazed that the U.S and fellow governments negotiating with Iran were able to contain so much of what Iran was doing. Among other things, Iran was restricted to a very tiny amount of low enriched uranium, uh, much less than could be upgraded to make a weapon. At the same time, agreed to accept very intrusive inspections from the international community. And for the first time of any place in the world, the Iranians agreed that they would not import anything having to do with any possibility of being engaged in their nuclear program without the approval of the six countries negotiating with Iran. Uh, we, of course, watched that very carefully to make sure that there were no escapes. Um, the Iranians maintained that agreement. There were monthly reports by the International Atomic Energy Agency beginning in 2015. Uh, right up until well after we came out of the agreement, uh, they, were, they were abiding by it. Uh, and those reports were backed up uh, by the intelligence agencies of the major world powers, all of whom I think were supportive of this agreement uh, and had their own unilateral capacities to look at Iran. So it wasn't as if there was some kind of beguiling of an international inspector uh, with Iranian caviar uh, to overlook problems that one way or another uh, might cause problems with the agreement. Um, our getting out of the agreement, the President explained in his own way, I'm not sure I can tell you what it meant, but it did in one way or another, I think, unfortunately, upset the apple cart very badly. Um, it was an interesting agreement because it was constructed by those that put it together to have no way legally of getting out. And that was designed to keep Iran in. And so for us to get out, we had to violate the agreement. Not a comfortable position for a country whose foreign policy 
had been based on the sanctity of agreements in international law for many, many years. Um, and that in itself uh, consternated the Iranians, although they had fully expected that this might happen. Uh, that meant that we went back to a pressure policy with Iran, increasing economic sanctions in particular. And it meant that Iran, particularly because we were prepared to sanction our friends and allies if they traded with Iran, was deprived of the kind of income it hoped to derive as a way of obviously convincing its own people uh, that they were benefiting from the cessation uh, of the nuclear activity to which we objected. And we have been through several rounds now uh, of Iranian increase uh, in both enrichment and the level of enrichment. Not yet, I think, passing what I would call a peril point or a danger point, but certainly approaching that. And this has been the Iranian primary answer uh, to what has been essentially rising pressure, uh, mainly on the part of the United States on them, uh, without yet a clear statement of what our objectives are, although a better agreement was clearly very much in the mind of the president uh, when he talked about getting out. So where are we and what might we think about doing? in terms of this particular problem. We are in a situation now with respect to Iran uh, that one of the outcome options is not far away at this time, and that's war by accident, miscalculation, misjudgment, misperception, misguidance, whatever you want to call it. Hmm. I don't think either side wants war. <clears throat> I think either side in one way or another is dealing with the problem uh, in a way that it hopes conveys the message that it doesn't want war. But the Iranians, in addition to upping the ante on the weapons side, I'm sorry, upping the ante on the, uh, on the nuclear side, in the nuclear material side, on the, on the uranium enrichment side, have at the same time <coughs> begun to up the ante on what I would call the military side. So you're all aware of the fact that uh, over the summer, uh, first one tanker, and then three, and then more, uh, had mines put against their hulls, uh, foreign tankers, not Iranian tankers, that the British stopped on the basis of information we shared with them, I'm sure, an Iranian tanker in Gibraltar destined to take oil to Syria, contrary to sanctions against Syria. Uh, and the Iranians stopped and turn a British tanker going past Iran in the vital straits of Hormuz uh, between the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea and incarcerated it. Both of those have since been released. The Iranians shot down, as you know, a significantly large American drone. Uh, and then in the middle of September, I think to the surprise of almost everyone, uh, launched an attack against a vital Saudi oil facility in a place called Abqai. Perhaps the centerpiece of the processing arrangements that are present in Saudi Arabia for moving its crude oil into the international market. And similarly, uh, on a new field in, in the center of Saudi Arabia and its production capacity. Uh, the Saudis originally announced him that that field and that action against the field and the action against the facility would cut 5.7 million barrels a day from their 9 to 11 million barrel a day production capacity. A really serious hit. What is interesting then is that both the United States and Saudi Arabia have known for years that that facility may have been a primary target uh, for those who wanted to interrupt Saudi oil supplies. And certainly since the 1990s, uh, both the Saudi oil company Aramco and others have clearly provided plans and stockpiled material that put that facility back to work in a week, which is quite phenomenal. And while the Saudis are prideful of having done that, uh, it is clear that at least that particular thing had been anticipated and reacted to 
And so there was not the long-term uh, important damage done to world oil supplies that we saw when the Iraqis invaded Kuwait or when uh, King Faisal in the 70s declared an embargo as a result of disappointment over Middle East peace negotiations. Nevertheless, it was important. Um, so one alternative is further conflict. And if the Iranians are convinced that they can do again what they did in Saudi Arabia, perhaps more vigorously and with a larger effect, then they are running into a situation where I am not sure that we will resign ourselves to sitting by. Uh, and I can understand that. Uh, and if that's the case, we are in for a tit-for-tat military exchange. And to me, that's the worst of all alternatives because it gets you directly nowhere except further up the escalatory ladder. And, and that, unfortunately, is ripe for accident and miscalculation. The second trap, and interestingly enough, it comes directly out of the effort made uh, in September and October by French President Macron uh, with both President Trump and President Rouhani of Iran is a negotiating outcome. And not so much to the surprise of a lot of us, it's quite clear that President Trump wants a summit level meeting with President Rouhani, uh, shades of Kim Jong-un. Nevertheless, that's there and it's an important alternative. Uh, and one would much rather see a negotiated outcome than an unnegotiated outcome. And President Macron set the stage for this when he met with both of them and then in New York arranged the possibility, if not of a meeting, a telephone call between them. Uh, and coming out of his meeting with President Trump and presumably with President Rouhani, uh, there was an agreement. And that agreement would be that Iran would go back uh, to complying with its nuclear obligations. That Iran would at the same time uh, be willing uh, to open the door to another nuclear negotiation. And without actually saying so, clearly it was implied that there could be, as a result, a startup of this by a Trump Rouhani meeting. Iran further agreed that it would not commit aggression and finally agreed that it would also undertake regional negotiations to try to establish a more peaceful set of arrangements in the area of the Gulf, something that has clearly been going downhill for some time. Uh, these were, in my own view, uh, wise suggestions. Uh, and they failed, and they failed uh, literally on the basis of two factors. Factor number one is that Rouhani said, uh, I'm not ready to meet Trump unless I can get a public statement by the United States or a written document signed that, that will say that the United States is prepared to proceed on the basis of these four French suggestions. And President Trump, because, I'm sorry, one of those suggestions was that we would return the sanctions regime to what it was in 2017, that is, take off all the sanctions on our friends and allies about their trade with Europe. It's important to have that. And the President said no. I don't know why he said no. He perhaps had his own reasons. Uh, in any event, so the phone call never took place. And the story is wonderful. Rohani, in order to avoid the phone call, locked himself in his bedroom in the New York hotel, totally <laughs> incommunicado, in order to avoid the fact that the phone might ring in the hearing of anybody. Mm. And so that failed. Now, some of this is humorous, some of it is interesting, and all of it is sad. Sad in the sense that there was an opportunity. Uh, sad in the sense that there was an opportunity with a set-piece focus, unlike North Korea, where the focus was only up here in the stratosphere, get rid of nuclear weapons. And um, my own view, my own humble view is that an initial arrangement arrived at through a third party, whether it's France or somebody else, that would have two simple steps on each side. A return in full or significantly 
uh, of Iran to its nuclear obligations on one side, and on the U.S. side, either the reopening uh, that we had kept going for a while of Iran's capacity to trade oil for eight countries, including China and India, in a limited way, or some or all of the sanctions put on in 2017 taken off. Uh, that would have to be negotiated. It would not try to be expansive, would not try to be large, but it was based on, is based on the idea that performance would be required before a meeting. Uh, and at the same time, it would say, if the agreement is kept on both sides, then the two will meet at a time that they will determine and a place they will determine. And then finally, the French four items will form the, the central agenda for their meeting, so that in fact we have some specificity about some of the things that can be accomplished in the negotiation. Something that so far I think has eluded the Korean negotiations, uh, where I think as well some stepwise progress uh, would have been useful coming out of the last <coughs> meeting, but it wasn't possible to make that happen. In any event, uh, that's where we are. Uh, that's what the opportunity is. And my track record is absolutely perfect. Nothing I've ever said publicly or privately to the administration has ever been accepted. <laughs> so I tell you that uh, because I don't want you to go out of here uh, feeling that there is a lot of hope out there. You said so. But I do want you to think and, 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 and contemplate, one, that the alternative for a war is not a really good outcome. And secondly, there is a way to go ahead. And there may be a lot better ways to go ahead. I've never said that anybody has a monopoly on all the good ideas, but this is one way, and it opens the door for some variations in how and in what way you put it together that could be helpful. And the object of diplomacy is to take challenges and turn them into opportunities. And this is certainly designed to take a really big challenge and see if we can build it into a small opportunity that can grow as time goes in here. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for coming tonight. And I thank you in advance for your questions, which I know will be challenging, but also opportunities. So we're turning on the microphone. Uh, we uh, have a request for uh, some student questions first, and the rest come line up to uh, behind there. And if the students are shy, we'll take whoever can get to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> While they're getting settled, I'll open with a question. What do you think was the uh, Iranian strategy in mind in attacking the Saudi, assuming that it was Iran attacking the Saudi oil facilities. Was it merely to frighten the Europeans into working harder for economic uh, relief? Or did they have some other grand strategy for that? I think that was certainly one. The second was to show that if we continue to increase pressure, they could continue to increase pressure. And so it was an effort to trump Trump. <laughs> in that, but it also had a fascinating effect. It clearly was revelatory of the fact that the U.S. was not really interested in the war. And it certainly hurt us with Saudi Arabia that expected us to come to their rescue, particularly in an attack that was as egregious and as significant as this was. And finally, it demonstrated to the rest of the world, and not least to Israel, they could manage precisely time guided missile uh, and uh, cruise missile attacks against a significant target uh, without having those attacks discovered or interrupted in advance. And so it had all of those pieces to it, Peter, that I think are important here. Uh, and that obviously has set teeth on edge. And boy, now we have a New York subway line, so let's go. <laughs> that the uh, president said by uh, leaving the nuclear agreement uh, in such a way that it, 
Do you think that it will have a lasting impact on our diplomatic power? Not that it will have a lasting effect, it is having a lasting effect. I think in many ways, as I travel around the world and talk with people who are very interested in the U.S. and have been our friends and allies, uh, they wonder whether will we be there for them if there is a difficult situation. Uh, that the statement of America first seemingly at least seems to eliminate the idea that multilateral and, co and coalition uh, foreign policy activities, particularly military, are within the scope of our foreign policy, if I can put it that way, and that has shaken them up. And then they kind of look at the United States and say, well, the president has a tweak policy, and the State Department has its own policy, and the Defense Department has its own <coughs> policy, uh, and one set of policies the tweet policy put us on Turkey's side at the beginning of the week and on the Kurdish side at the end of the week. And so where are we in terms of can we be relied upon? Uh, and of course, in answer to Peter's question, I said uh, Saudis, the Kurds, and others wonder in fact whether their relationship with us counts for anything uh, in the future. And so this means that people around the world I think still wonder what it is that the United States do in any particular situation. That's almost ingrained from the past. But they have come to the view that that is basically a crapshoot. That they'll have to wait and see what the tweets say. Uh, or the tweets say. <laughs> before they know what it is we're going to do and then wonder whether that's the real policy or the real policy will come out sometime later. And so the uncertainty is a disturbing factor. Uh, next, please, sir. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Um, I'm also interested in possibly joining the State Department and the UN growing up. Um, do you have any advice, what type of skills you, I should strengthen, um, what you've had to do a lot? But I think that you should look at the State Department exam, and I would urge you to take it. Uh, people were kind enough to name a State Department ROTC type program in my honor. Uh, and uh, that program helps people who need funding for additional graduate school to prepare themselves. And I think that looking at foreign policy as an important subject would be a good idea to help you with the exam. But I also tell you, that the State Department is taking people with a wide range of degrees, chemistry, physics, biology, marketing, business administration. There's a place there for people with most of those backgrounds and skills. And so please do, look at the exam. I think you can take the initial step online. I would urge you to do so. And if you don't do well the first time, come back. Thanks. How accurate are our estimates of the uranium's ability to, uh, to purify uranium? And how accurate are our estimates as to how much they've got and at what levels of, of concentration they reach? Great question. And I think that uh, pretty accurate. For example, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency has put into their centrifuge cascades, online monitoring of the level of enrichment of the material passing through the cascades on a 24-7, 365 basis. That we have, over a long period of time, uh, always looked at how much uh, uranium the Iranians mined and how much they imported, and how much they then converted uh, into the process of upgrading it with their enrichment facilities. We know what their output of centrifuges is, uh, and we have, I think, continuous monitoring of that kind of activity. Uh, I believe that we have a pretty good idea, both from our unilateral intelligence and our international monitoring, where they are doing this, and therefore the size of the programs, and they are regularly measured and so that will help us. 
This particular agreement also allows the international community to measure uh, and visit all of the facilities making centrifuges in Iran so we know what the manufacturing output is, how many and where it's going. And the fact is they're limited in the number of centrifuges they're allowed to have. And they're limited certainly in the number of new design centrifuges they can use and work with and what they can produce with those. So it's a pretty broad one. I don't think anybody will ever tell you it's 110%. Um, but I can tell you that I think given the diversity of the measurement and monitoring questions, uh, we're close into the 99 range. And it's very interesting because the new theory of monitoring uh, uh, against violations of arms control agreements is in fact to use the, the statistical theory that the more we have to look at various pieces of the operation, the more assurance we have of a high probability of success. Thank you. Thank you.